very excited to be here. Uh, super glad uh, that we were able to put this together. Uh, video is a huge um, part of the internet, a huge part of the human experience, and a big thing that uh, all of us working on IPFS, Falcoin, Protocol Apps, and so on um, care a lot about. Uh, and we're super excited to finally be able to dedicate time and energy into this because we've been kind of on a lot of side quests in between. Uh, so I want to kind of talk about uh, this range of things. So I want to kind of talk about video and humanity for a moment video and computing and sort of a, uh, just get a sense of the scale that we're talking about. Um, talk about video and Web3 so far, um, then talk about vi video and Web3 in 2023. Um, so like what's gonna happen sort of like next year, at least from our corner of the world and what we can see. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of include in here a request for startups because there's a bunch of really cool ideas um, and really cool, cool uh, resources for, for, um, for builders. Uh, and then, uh, I'll kind of like talk a bit about kind of 2024 and beyond, uh, and then uh, do some Q and A if useful. Um, though I, I bet like there's a ton of questions for um, all speakers here, so maybe we can do that together. Um, so I just want to kind of reflect that uh, humans are extremely um, moved by storytelling, right? So a, a storytelling and communicating through um, telling the stories of heroes and characters and situations and complex um, uh, emotions is how we communicate uh, ideas with the, to each other and how we um, just convey lots of the information that we process. Uh, so all of this, um, do you want mic here? This one? Further? Good? Closer, closer? Okay, is this better? Um, so I'm sure everybody here and everybody watching this uh, consumes an enormous amount of video in, in their lives. Uh, movies have been you know, a huge fraction of, um, of all of our lives in terms of shaping what we know, what we understand, uh, the stories that move us, the, uh, our perspectives, and so on. Um, and this is you know, increasing every year. So not only are there more movies and more important storytelling, um, but this is starting to become, um, and I need like a missing a slide here, um, but it's starting to get uh, turned into uh, all of the social media video that we uh, consume on a daily basis. So it's not just kind of like these large uh, AAA type or like, you know, high level titles and whatnot, but it's really kind of turning into um, uh, tons of short videos from uh, hundreds of millions of billions of people around the planet uh, communicating to each other. Uh, and video is the closest analog that we have to kind of being in person at scale. Uh, that's going to change once we have AR and VR and so on, but those, those technologies are still, um, there's going to be many years before those are here. Uh, so video is the closest analog that we have to a human connection at scale, uh, which is why kind of video is a, a huge part of our, our lives. Uh, I want to talk about, a little bit about stats. So this is kind of, um, and, and a lot of these are going to just grab from, from various sources in the web, uh, just um, some of them are like older, some of them are kind of, uh, uh, estimates about the future and so on. Uh, just, I want to give you a sense of like the scale that we're talking about. Um, so this is average time spent per adult uh, per day uh, in the U.S. And so this is kind of like I think 11 hours it's saying. Um, and this is average time on like different kinds of, of media. So live TV is the blue, uh, um, radio is like the, the purple, uh, the green is kind of like um, DVD, Blu-rays, uh, game consoles. Um, internet on a computer is like that yellow, the orange is apps and web on the smartphone, and uh, apps and web on the tablet is like the red. Uh, and so, you know, a huge fraction of time is just watching video of some kind, either through TV, games, or, or others. Um, you know, here's another version of that, like this is the average time spent in the US 2020 to 2024 in TV and digital video. Uh, this is like multiple hours per day, so like if you add these two together, there's like five hours a day on average per person that's a lot of video. Um, this is in, in China. Um, this is in minutes, so 300 minutes uh, for digital video, 154 minutes. So the, yeah, it's very close to the uh, US estimate, so close to you know, 400 to 500 minutes. Uh, so you know, don't have to like, th this is enough to, like, for us to like, see that there's an enormous amount of uh, the human experience that is just consuming video. So it's not producing video, it's just consuming video. Um, most humans around the planet spend a lot of time just watching other people uh, kind of move on, on a screen. So what does that mean? That means that a huge fraction of our applications have to handle video. It, it, all of the social networks, a huge part of them is moving photos and video. Um, 
there's entire large scale applications devoted entirely to video, so things like YouTube and Twitch and so on. And uh, all, of, all of the kind of like personal computing or uh, devices, uh, you know, think of uh, cameras uh, and the high quality cameras and high quality video being a huge selling point for people recording. Um, sorry, for, for people buying phones and so on. Uh, so people want to record and produce uh, videos either for personal use or for, uh, for broadcasting. And this also goes into um, large scale infrastructure or, or systems that, you know, personal storage systems or uh, like shared, uh, you know, work oriented uh, storage systems and whatnot. So video is a huge part of everything in computing. Every single application has to deal with video in some way. And that includes you know, a variety of different formats. Think of like the scaling sizes of video. So um, think of videos, um, you know, every few years there's a new um, increase in the resolution of displays. So then that comes along with a bunch of new formats. Um, and so then kind of like that stress tests all of the tooling tools that we've built so far because now there's just like way more video. Um, side note there, like there's a bunch of like really interesting AI tools for kind of compressing video and that'll be super interesting. Um, it's also interesting to see how much video plays a role in the sort of like winning social networks. So Instagram very famously like was bought by Facebook because uh, Facebook was worried and it was not just the photos, it was the video too. So photos and video uh, was a big uh, part of Instagram. Snapchat, same thing. Um, in, in terms of like uh, threatening Facebook and, and so on. And later on TikTok, think, look at the rise of TikTok in a few years. Um, it's, it's been become a, an extremely successful platform, even without kind of like a lot of deep linking or a lot of the other features that people thought were important in social networks or a lot of communication, you know, kind of like the messaging system and whatnot is like abysmal compared to uh, a bunch of the other social networks. However, um, just producing the videos and having like this constant loop of uh, trends and you know, kind of memes propagating is, is like super fascinating. Um, I think like the TikTok verse is like um, kind of a fascinating cut into like what humanity is sort of like becoming, which is pretty pretty interesting. Um, a, a weird spot there is that it's it's kind of very bubbly in terms of creating um, different bubbles for different users to to inhabit and. Um, and so it gives people a super different view of the world based on kind of like who, who, who other, what creators or what others think like them and you know, what, what does TikTok think you want to see. Um, it's kind of like causing this divergence in what people think is, is, uh, is going on. But you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to primarily focus on like video and, and like uh, how to scale the use and so on. Um, yeah, here's another slice of some, some of the similar stuff, like how much time people spend in, in different social networks. I, I find this a little bit potentially off. Like I think TikTok is probably much larger than, than what is, what's shown here. Then there's streaming. So um, you know, th streaming came in as a totally different type of shared experience over, over the network. Uh, things like uh, Twitch certainly pioneered that. Uh, many other groups are, are getting into it too. Um, primarily very successful in games, but this can apply to many other systems. There's tons of um, tons of other kind of subparts of this. Uh, streaming is a huge uh, part of um, of the internet now because it creates like this shared experience of, around doing a thing, uh, and a lot of it is kind of again mediated by video. Uh, who knows? Maybe a lot of that will transfer into VR and AR later on. Um, this is pretty old. Um, I don't remember the exact year from this. Uh, I would suspect that Netflix is actually a lot smaller now, and other things have become much larger um, because you know this is I think pre Disney and pre other other things. Uh, but this, this gives you a sense of like the rough fraction of what's video on the on the network. So definitely like the net Netflix box, the YouTube box, the Prime Video box, HTTP Media Stream, the raw MPEG TS thing. Like just over 50% of us here is just video. <laughs> so like think of the the internet is for video in a sense, right? When it, when you think when it comes to consumer um, consumer traffic. Now it could be that AI. Um, models gave us a way of compressing a lot of this and turn it into a much smaller thing, but uh, my guess, I, I would not kind of bet, bet the farm on that. Um, here's another slice of the same kind of thing. So this is uh, you know, global IP traffic by application type. Um, in this uh, slice, uh, it shows sort of like most of it being, being video. Um, yeah, so, and then there's kind of like this uh, speculative, oh, oh, and one piece here, mobile is huge, right? So let's not forget that mobile is like the main way in which people consume media these days, mobile and tablets, and th those are particular systems where Web3 kind of sucks today, and that's, we have to do a bunch of work to make uh, mobile work much better. Um, 
there's kind of like this, I found like this neat speculative thing on one of these reports around um, different kinds of use cases and this report kind of like speculates that like uh, suddenly VR is going to be like a huge fraction of the pipes and so you know ultra high def VR will become like, will sort of like consume a huge fraction of people's bandwidth. I don't think that's probably going to play out that way because I think we'll find really clever ways of compressing that. Uh, we're not going to stream like video, we're probably going to stream kind of um, the, the actual computation that it's going to render somewhere else, but, but I don't know, could be wrong. Um, but at, at the very least, kind of a lot of groups are expecting video to keep growing. Cool, so video, huge part of humanity, therefore a huge part of all of the computing infrastructure and a massive fraction of the, of the, um, of the computing infrastructure and the web and so on. So let's talk about you know, video and Web3 so far. So when um, we started IPFS, uh, in fact, video was like one of the first things to, that, that we had, even in like the very early alpha demo. Um, there were a number of parts of that demo that were kind of around video. Um, because video is like one of the main, um, again, huge fraction of the, of the computing infrastructure, but it also sells the point of content addressing super well. As we heard from the last talk, like CADs are like this really useful way of, con of uh, content addressing information and then kind of deduplicating it. Now you have to handle all the transcoding and think about the different devices, uh, but that matrix is not enormous. So once you generate all, all of those, you can still content address a lot of that and move a lot of that stuff into the, into the edges. And you can get away from having to duplicate uh, tons of traffic uh, the same way, right? So imagine the example that I used you know, early on was like imagine if a room full of 100 people starts all you know, watching Gangnam Style all at the same time and like everyone starts downloading the same video from YouTube and like instead of kind of being able to d spread it around peer to peer, right? So like that's kind of what we're talking about. Um, and so making sure that we kind of preserve content addressing all the way through and especially phones are able to um, pull content from each other in the same Wi-Fi network, that's gonna remain um, a pretty important priority um, in the long term. Now it's pretty hard to get this to work right, so there's you know, kind of a lot of work to do to, uh, to make it good. So in terms of um, IPFS, like the, the scale of the gateway, we're, uh, we're gonna kind of like segment this out later in terms of um, use, uh, so things like video and so on can, can, be, uh, can be seen, but a huge, a very large fraction of what com kind of comes through the gateway is video. Um, the gateway is now serving you know, over 10 million uh, uniquely active users, so that's like over 10 million people use um, uh, requests through, through, through our gateway and uh, you know, some fraction of those are video. Um, and we're kind of like on the order of like 1.5 billion weekly requests, uh, which is a lot of requests, especially if a lot of that is video. And so being able to serve video extremely well, efficiently, especially this, the same video, matters a lot, to, a lot to these systems. But know that this is not yet, you know, 100 million users or a billion users. Web3 is still kind of like on its way up. We have a couple orders of magnitude to go. So not, you know, five orders of magnitude to go, only two, um, but those are kind of the ones that matter the most. Um, Great, and so you know, there's a b been a ton of like different kinds of tools along the years uh, trying to mix IPFS and and streaming and so on, and you know, there's DTube and and many other groups, and a bunch of like the applications that I've used uh, IPFS over the years have kind of focused on on video. Uh, I want to highlight one particular use case around video that that actually is very um, meaningful, which is, and, and this also kind of goes into into Filecoin. Um, the Starling Lab uh, is a group that has been. Um, dedicating a, a whole set of efforts to um, using some of this technology to um, enable groups to archive extremely important cultural information. So think of like um, building a kind of tamper-proof lo uh, log and archive of testimony of survivors of extreme uh, circumstances like genocide and so on. And um, the, the lab has been extremely good in terms of uh, already kind of creating these extremely valuable archives of many, um, uh, many such events by kind of getting um, direct testimonial evidence from many um, uh, survivors of these, these uh, you know, 55,000 survivors uh, so far across a, a ton of different crises. Um, and these require um, uh, the kind of technology that Web3 gives in terms of being able to have a record of the data being uh, uh, preserved in a particular way where it's tamper proof so you don't want that to be generated in the future. You want to know precisely when it was generated. You want to have um, cryptographic proof that it's been stored over time. You want to know um, who's trying to access it uh, and so on. In fact, in a lot of these cases, you, um, the survivors do not want their testimony to be accessed until after their death. And so there's like requirements there about how are you going to store this and what, the, what guarantees you want around this um, 
these, th this kind of content to make sure that, that data is not actually spread or revealed uh, or decrypted until the future. Uh, this is one of the really kind of interesting intersections for and, and use cases for a lot of the cryptography that's being developed, right? So things like verifiable delay functions give you a way to, to give people that certainty. You can encrypt something and without a key um, uh, with, with a delay function that then produces some ciphertext that nobody can decrypt until a certain amount of time passes. And that, sort of, that kind of gives people um, you know, super um, interesting kind of new applications for, for this. And, and you know, video is a huge fraction of this, these kinds of archives. Uh, and then, of course, there's life here. Uh, you know, the world's open video infrastructure, there's all, um, as we saw in the last two talks, all kinds of parts around how do you um, capture, uh, encode, and transcode, or a lot of other uh, video processing in between, and get the video to users across a set of devices. And there's a bunch of, in that kind of middle part, just lots of different kinds of processing that, that'll happen, not just live in terms of streaming, but kind of once you capture the video, Later on, you might want to do all kinds of post-processing, um, including kind of uh, editing passes, or um, you know, subtitling, or captioning, or um, altering, or like blurring faces, for example, or um, or later on, imagine kind of like remixing uh, videos together, or or AI processing, as we were seeing in the in the pipelines. Um, um, graph. And um, there's also you know, plug for Live Your Studio, which is uh, uh, super cool. There's also things like Huddle. Um, Huddle uses both LifePeer and IPFS and Talkwin um, to build kind of like a, a kind of Zoom-like video meeting type experience um, with a lot of the kind of the Web3 primitives, so token gating, uh, login through these different tools, um, and then storing all the rec recordings in IPFS and Talkwin um, to be able to kind of access all that uh, information later. Um, and they're kind of developing an SDK too, which kind of simplifies a lot of the a lot of the things that you have to do to, to produce these kinds of applications. Um, the Falcon Network is scaling a lot of the data, so there's an enormous amount of, um, of growth there. Um, a significant fraction of this um, is video. It's not, I don't think it's close to 10% yet, um, but we, this is another one that we need to segment by, by use case. Um, but eventually it will be because um, a, not just the, the traffic on the internet in terms of serving, but a, a huge amount of the information stored in the world is video. Turns out a lot of it is um, security camera footage around the world, like this entire like dedicated specific hardware developed for that. And so there's some hard questions there. So how do you do this in a way that like preserves human rights? Where like you, this, this kind of like recording and storing of recordings is gonna happen. Um, how do you do it in a way that like um, is, is, yeah, again, preserves human rights in some way. So um, it might be things like where you can encode some um, ways of like doing kind of um, uh, recognition of like who, 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 are, who are in the videos and so on, and therefore kind of like creating structures that might um, involve their consent in terms of how that video is used or, or, or stuff like that. That's kind of some potentially interesting stuff that can, can emerge out of, um, out of Web3. Uh, cool, so that's kind of like you know, the, the video in Web3 so far. Let's talk about it next year. Um, so here's like some claims that, that I'll make. So I think Web3 video use cases will keep scaling. Um, those, they'll, they'll keep scaling a lot, probably will grow somewhere like five to 10X uh, this next year. Uh, I think we'll probably get close to 100 million users of Web3 video. I don't know that we'll reach it, but I think we, we definitely have a shot at 10X in kind of where we are now. Um, I think we'll get to about a petabyte to 10 petabytes of video in, in Web3. Um, just for reference, that's about like 50,000 4K movies or four million 4K short videos. That's a lot of video. So video is large, but it's not that large. So you know, a petabyte actually can hold a ton of video. Um, so I think we'll kind of like roughly be roughly be there. Um, and now the the thing that's going to be much more interesting is like being able to deliver uh, the video to users at sub second speeds. That's where we'll see a ton of scale change. So I think we'll get to um, CDNs that have you know tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of of nodes delivering video to tens of millions of users uh, with like sub-second retrieval. So that's like, that does not happen today. Not like not well enough, not at that scale. I think that's a thing that's gonna happen next year. Um, and then I think uh, video computation will be a significant fraction of the compute over data network. So as we're hearing in the last talk, video compute is gonna be a, a huge part of, of Web3 and so on. Um, th there's gonna be a lot of these kind of decentralized computation networks. Um, I think that computing over video is going to be a, a large fraction of it. Uh, and one interesting neat intersection between crypto and AI might be um, scaling the recent models to do beyond image, like actually video generation and video processing, and you might be able to use uh, crypto networks to assemble the kind of 
um, data center build outs that you need to be able to run that at scale. What I don't think we'll see next year that I think is going to be deferred until 2024 and beyond is, um, you know, probably, you know, scaling web three video use cases to, you know, web two sizes. Like that's going to be, I think, like at least another year and a half, if not more. Um, getting to billions of users or, you know, getting to tens or hundreds of petabytes of video. Um, and I think we won't yet see these CDNs like kind of like provide that performance worldwide at massive scale. So like we'll, we'll see that CDN performance um, uh, really well for kind of like, you know, one to 10 million users, but not quite say billions of users. And that's mostly really limited not by the CDNs, just but by the, by the adoption of Web3. Uh, and I don't think we'll see social networks yet. So a lot of people have, you know, asked me for like many years, when will we see Web3 uh, social networks? Um, social networks are rate limited by the fact that today you cannot have a backend in Web3. So it's extremely difficult to have um, the, the, the kind of processing that a social network needs to do on the data in a verifiable and private way. Therefore, all of the groups that are trying to do social networks in Web3 end up in this kind of like Web 2.5 mode where all of their backends are in AWS anyway. Um, so I think those are still going to take a while to, to arrive. Uh, yeah, so I think like, you know, a huge focus for us will be kind of um, the, the CDN uh, scaling, being able to kind of deliver this uh, super fast. Um, the, the approach that we're going to take for that is to create the structure where there's kind of like a map of the, of the Falcon network with source clients going into on-ramps. Uh, these data on-ramps are kind of uh, use case specific products that, that tune the, the APIs for that use case um, and kind of enable kind of bringing all the data into the source providers. Uh, and from there, the data will be served out to users. And so we'll use, the way that the CDN will, will work is, um, and this is Saturn, to kind of like split the world into a set of regions and then you know, have a set of like L1 and L2 caches in those regions to be able to pin content to that place. Uh, this actually might be a great place to put live peer transcoders. Like you can probably assign transcoders to exist in those regions to be able to transcode the video there, um, you know, live uh, close to the user, so that there's no you know very long hops going to to the end uh, to the end user. Uh, and so you know, this is how we're going to get to like sub-second retrieval, so that when you are asking for something, you can find the video right away uh, close to you. And like I said earlier, you know, um, ten. One to ten petabytes is not that much storage. Like you know, the five point network has sixteen exabytes. So one to ten petabytes, we can totally replicate all of the video that we have across all regions. Like we don't even have to select what to put in different places. We can just dump all of it into into all these regions to be able to serve serve it really, really, really fast. Um, or at the very least, the the first parts. Like if you want to scale that, you can take a video, take the take the beginning part and kind of the index over the whole video and cache that very close to the user. Because um, in that way you can like start playing the video right away. Kind of like the, this is how Netflix and others achieve that super high quality feel. Of, like you press the play button and immediately you, you see like 4K video. The way they do it is they prefetch all of that into into the user's machine, and so we can we can get to get to being able to do that. Uh, one cool thing that might be relevant to a lot of the video folks is that um, there's a, a system called uh, Falcon Station that it's kind of like a network agnostic worker node. That just kind of like comes into uh, into your computer or your server or phone or whatever, and can like use whatever node, um, like sort of like profiles your computer and figures out like what should you run, um, and it kind of like uh, grabs jobs from those potential networks based on kind of like what's more most profitable for you, um, and so we're thinking of like that potentially being really useful for uh, for various networks. Um, Cool. So then, another you know huge fraction part of this uh, as kind of like we ship FEM, um, and that brings uh, a whole bunch of um, use cases that'll give rise to compute over data networks, which are kind of like a way of doing these large, very large scale pipelines of processing over um, over data that's stored on on Falcon. So that uh, that's where you can get into like super interesting kind of. Um, uh, large scale processing of, of video, um, and this is where like you, you might um, yeah kind of think of like data science pipelines or machine learning pipelines and all that kind of stuff. And so the um, this is from your talk a few days ago. Like this pipeline, video processing pipeline uh, stuff, I think is like perfect fit for for a lot of the, these kinds of these kinds of networks. Or like you you can you're gonna be able to do a lot of different kinds of things. I think video and AI merging is gonna be a, a big part of um, of crypto down the road. Um, one other use case that I think will be pretty relevant for video is DSI. Um, so it turns out that there's a lot of video that is part of, um, of, of science. Um, scientists have to like not just take images and pictures of things, but they also have to like process tons of video in many cases. Like you know, lots of instruments have to record some behavior happening and whatnot. 
and all that video needs to be part of the data that you pr produce as part of your paper. Um, so that could be, um, that you definitely need to content address, you need to make open access, you need to preserve in perpetuity, um, and you might have like requirements and restrictions as to how that video is served or to whom it serves. You might need special credentialing, uh, but you want that credentialing to be long-term oriented with like you know, stable identifiers. So this is where, um, you know, I think video will, will probably, um, yeah, the design video might, might intersect here. Um, cool, and then I think the, Games and metaverses will blend with video in pretty deep ways next year where uh, one part is you wanna be in kind of some kind of metaverse environment and you wanna be able to play a video or you might wanna be able to kind of um, uh, have somebody kind of like, um, you, you might have metaverses where like you're grabbing somebody's camera feed and then like wrapping it into a character or something like that. So you have like some processing of video that's happening real time uh, and then kind of embedded into, into the environment. Um, or you might have like, um, you might use video streams as textures in, in different, uh, different parts of the world and, and so on. So I think like, we'll see a ton of this experimentation, but I think it won't be yet in 2023 be um, very fleshed out. I think it'll be a, just a lot of experimentation. So I'll flag a, a kind of like a quick request for startups here and kind of flag some resources for builders. Uh, so first off, like there's a ton of hackathons across our communities and grants, uh, like both micro grants for people to get started and like dev grants for like larger projects and kind of a request for startups where you can hear um, different, um, about different potential like business ideas. Um, so definitely look out for, for all of those. This can be you know, helpful to you um, that are trying to build things. Um, and once some of the ideas start scaling, you can get into kind of accelerators and VC funding and network funding. So VC funding, um, that you know, traditional type uh, venture capital, um, there's a bunch of resources like that across our, our ecosystems. Um, network funding is more about generating public goods. So think of like grants and, and larger scale grants and so on, um, but for kind of products that are gonna be kind of good for the community and, and there's no kind of like direct value capture um, viable there. So I'll give kind of like a quick request for startups for video. Um, so there's a thing in our community uh, called Web3 Storage, which is a really useful kind of platform for developers that are trying to build Web3 objects. Uh, we kind of, uh, and you know, it's been kind of used to back, uh, do, it's kind of like the back end of NFT storage. That's kind of how a ton of NFTs get, get uh, stored online. We need a version of that for video. So there's kind of like a missing video.storage uh, tool and system. And so this is kind of like an open thing where you can write a bunch of tooling and interfaces and APIs that are tuned specifically for the video use case uh, to make it super easy to store and retrieve video or like play it and or like embed it into applications and where you can kind of handle all of like the, the relevant, uh, various relevant tools. Um, and so I think we need some kind of like a video on ramp. Um, the pipeline stuff that, that I described, there's tons of different use cases here. Uh, and I think um, the Live Video Network has all of the computing nodes there ready uh, for all of this kind of use. So I think uh, there's, there's a bunch of like things that you can do with, with uh, all of this, this tooling. Um, plug also so plug for the Life Year SDK and, and Studio and so on and plug for Huddle. Uh, both of these SDKs are I think extremely useful resources for for builders uh, generating experiences. Like this token gating thing, I think has been like all the infrastructure is now there. It has ju just yet to be used at scale, and I think like that's going to be um, more and more more and more useful. Um, there's things like you know video archives. Think of like things like Flickr and so on. Uh, there's you know possible like startups uh, there. Um, I think stock photo and video is now totally doable in Web3. Like we have everything we needed to make a stock photo or stock video website um, or platform. You can now make one of these. And the reason why you might want to do it is because these marketplaces are super extractive. Like they charge a huge fraction of the fees. And so there, and there's a ton of communities of creators here that uh, are really frustrated about it. Like you can find tons of forum posts where um, the creators in these communities are like really frustrated about the kind of like take rate there. So you can just go and like replicate this exact business model in Web3, use all of these as a case that we're describing, and right away have like a phenomenal business and all you have to do is just increase the fee, right? Like just undercut those, those other groups. Um, I think, you know, pay-per-view pay media and so on has not been uh, used enough. Um, I think games in Web3, um, we're super interested in like help looking at and helping support um, a lot of game development. L less on the kind of like, um, um, pay like I, I see a lot of groups that get into, into blockchain development and, and gaming and so on immediately jump into kind of like um, tokenizing and kind of the economic 
primitives and so on, I would kind of like put that aside for a long time and just kind of think about generating extremely interesting games based on the kind of decentralization primitives or having these dynamic worlds that communities can curate. There's a ton of super interesting possibilities there. Think of like being able to generate MMOs that are kind of like governed by users and the, and their, the future of these systems is defined by users and you can have, think of like, you know, the, what used to be like a guild or a clan in a game can turn into a DAO and you can have like actual membership and actual resources controlled by these, by these communities. And so like the, the, yeah, at that point like the games are like really becoming much more real, right? So um, I would lean on kind of would love to see a lot more games that are actually doing that and just taking traditional structures with games and then embedding like the new coordination primitives, um, not necessarily kind of like the economic flows. Um, though of course, yeah, the, the economic thing ideas are, are good. VR and AR game, games I think will, will uh, come around and yeah, I, I would plug also kind of, um, there's all these kind of like amazing virtual worlds now that have been generated. Uh, would love to see applications being developed with them either applications where you plug in a room and then the application kind of runs in that room um, or kind of like maybe uh, runs across rooms or, or, or whatever or maybe applications that are designed specifically for particular rooms. So some of these builds are huge and, and so amazing that like they might warrant generating some kind of experience for those environments. And so think of like meetups and conferences and concerts and like all kinds of like larger scale shared experiences that you might have um, that relate to this. And you know this is not exactly video in terms of like, you know, 2D images and like, you know, sequentially over time, um, but a lot of the challenges are the same and it's the same kind of technology underneath the hood. So all the stuff that we've been talking about in terms of video, a lot of it is applicable to, um, to this kind of virtual world uh, environment. Um, yeah, cool. So I think like a bunch of anniversary cases and, and so on. Uh, cool. I'll talk briefly about 2024 and beyond, um, and kind of the, and the, what I'll really kind of speak to is just kind of what we started with, uh, which is kind of, um, hey, like we're not yet going to be hitting these scales, but like we have to, and so in 2024 and beyond, like we should really be looking to produce products that that scale to billions of users. We should be building the social networks, uh, whether it's by upgrading the ones that we currently have or create new ones, like figure out what's gonna be the TikTok to TikTok, right? Like what, it, like TikTok's been like this huge um, growth relative to the other social networks. We've seen this before many times. There's gonna be another social network. Uh, maybe that one will be a Web3 native social network, so maybe figure out what that is. Um, and then kind of uh, help get kind of the, the scale of, of, of use cases um, uh, broadly. And then it'd be really great to now be able to kind of have a version of this slide say a few years from now, um, I don't know exactly when, maybe 2024, maybe 2026, where you know, suddenly like by mainstream accounting, one of the, one at least of the major things that humans are spending time on is like directly Web3 native completely. That would be like a huge result. Um, now it'll take way longer than that, it'll take probably another five years before it's like 50% Web3. Uh, but you know, you gotta start somewhere um, and, and, um, and so on. And for the record, by the way, it took like Web 2 is close to 10 years to, to do that, to transition from there from like Web 1 into Web 2. Um, so um, Web 3 is kind of like on, on a similar, similar trajectory. And uh, yes, yeah, so I think like it'd be great to then be able to reflect back to this and say, hey look, figure out how much of this traffic on the internet is now being stored, um, processed, transcoded, served by Web 3 tools uh, and be able to kind of like um, see, see like a huge win out of it. All of the tooling that we have, content addressing, um, decentralized networks, like massive scale um, uh, processors and like you know, pipe, computing pipelines and CDN nodes and so on, all of that is perfect, is like a perfect uh, computing infrastructure for video, for being able to serve all of this stuff. It's just a lot of software that we have to write in between now and then to be able to kind of like um, uh, scale this. And uh, I do think like streaming, streaming has a ton of, because of its community orientation, it might be super amenable to Web3 tools now. So, so um, uh, this is one of those cases where like maybe a Web 2.5 thing will actually potentially work super well with, um, with the communities. Uh, cool, and so you know, hopefully if we like do our jobs well, then you know, the, the super meaningful stories of our time will be this talked about, experienced, um, seen, and so on through like Web3 platforms that you know, respect your rights. Cool, uh, I'll stop there and do q and One, thank you so much. That was amazing. We have time for one or two questions before I do want to bring up Sean from the Gallery DAO who's going to do a quick demo on what is likely possible with AI and XR. But yeah, if anyone has any questions. 
Okay, to uh, uh, to achieve the uh, mass adoption or mass delivery of uh, uh, Web3 uh, video, uh, what's the technical barrier we are facing now? The big, biggest. Um, I think just scaling the retail market at this point. Yeah. Scaling, scaling the CDN stuff that I showed. So we have like the beginnings of the CDNs, like just scaling them. Yeah, so, so it'll be some amount of like new software being released over the next three to four quarters. Um, but you know, it, it, you can start using the software that it is there now, scale it to a, to a larger size and keep going. No, uh, yeah, so it is to get bandwidth, but, uh, but the rate limiter is, is just kind of increase the, the size of those networks. Yep. Hi, I'm uh, Mihai, co-founder at uh, Beam. So big users, we're starting one, you know, force of life here. Um, what we're seeing in the creator space, uh, and when I talk about creator, it's both filmmakers, but also TikTokers, YouTubers, and so on. There's an oversaturation of the dependence on those platforms, and the big question is what's coming next. And when you come from Web3 with that logic, it doesn't seem that the next iteration of platforms is another platform, because Web3 is essentially uh, not very compatible with the logic of a platform. A platform is something that kind of keeps you in. So uh, uh, it, not necessarily. I mean, like um, you can think of protocol like. Um, you don't have to have a platform be a captive walled garden. You can have an open platform, right? So think of the web as an open platform. I agree with you. So in a technical sense, that's completely right. Most of them look at it that, oh, what's the next thing where I should go? So a big trend we're seeing is that creators willing to create their own, so become their own platform. And if you take, uh, you know, IPFS, File, Filecoin, LifePeer, Lens protocol, you know, social graph on Web3, there you start imagining a world where the Web3 is the platform, but then each individual is the, its own platform that's completely free from, you know, dependency of centralized gatekeepers and um, in a way where they own everything, the content, the rights, the no, IP, think the users, and so on. I think the cost of producing an extremely high quality social network that tunes to a specific use case and tunes to what humans want now as opposed to what they wanted five years ago or ten years ago um, is tremendously expensive and it requires, today it requires hundreds of designers, developers, engineers and so on. And so because of that you'll still see large scale platforms and large scale social networks that are developed by various groups. Uh, that doesn't have to be a captive structure or a captive business model. Um, I think you, Web3 gives you a much better tool set to be able to generate those, those networks in a much better way. I just don't think that you'll get to a point where um, every creator is creating completely independent, disconnected experiences um, and have nearly the same level of success that kind of creators today can have in TikTok. What, what will happen if we do move in that world is that we'll have a power law distribution that's worse, where a very, very small amount of creators will have to, the resources required to produce super high quality experiences to then you know, yield that kind of, that kind of um, you know, digital high quality stuff. Um, and so I, don't, like, I think we'll still see a lot of products that are, that are built um, and then kind of plug in a lot of creators together. Again, that's not incompatible with, with much better primitives for ownership and, and um, sharing um, and, and so on.